Around 6.30 in the evening, Samara reached her destination. As she stepped her foot outside the car, the view surrounding her amazed her mind. Tall, dark mountains were all around her. At the foothill of these mountains, the gigantic old mansion stood like a dark fairy tale. The setting reminded her of the tales of Count Dracula. The exquisite artistry of Romanian architecture attracts Samara like nothing else. She started to take out her bags from the car just when the huge iron gate of the mansion opened and a man came walking to her. Hello, you must be Miss Willis. I am Daniel. It is me with whom you talked over the phone. Samara guessed the manager of such a mansion will be an old person, but Daniel was a young, handsome man. She took her bags and said, Call me Samara, and started walking towards the mansion. Daniel smiled and accompanied her inside the mansion. The mansion was ten times grander from the inside. The large hallways and corridors were filled with vast oil paintings and expansive decorations. A counter stood next to the door which finally gave the impression that this is a hotel. An old guy was standing on the counter. Daniel went to him and said, Give the keys to Miss Willis's room. The man handed over a metal key with room number 104. She then followed Daniel upstairs and another man came who carried her bags. Daniel told Samara that the mansion has many rooms divided into four tiers. They have finished renovating only the ground floor and the first floor. The second and third floor are right now out of use. But Samara can take a look for her research, but she might find a few rooms locked for maintenance purposes. Room 34 was at the end of the corridor. Daniel unlocked the room with the key, and the hotel staff put Samara's bags near the bed and left. The room is unique on its own. There was a soft white bed, a couch near the glass window that gave a view of the hills. Samara turned to Daniel and said, I'm already loving this place. Daniel smiled back and told her, the dinner will be ready around 8.30 p.m. The hotel staff will come to notify her when it's ready. Samara locked her door and lied on the bed. She was mesmerized by the view around her. The mansion was glamorous and mysterious at the same time. Around 8.15, the hotel staff came and told Samara that dinner is ready. While Samara walked down the stairs, she noticed three people were sitting at the dinner table. One is Daniel, and the other two people are the man at the counter and the hotel staff. Daniel smiled and said, We don't have many guests right now. Actually, we were planning to open this from the next month after the complete renovation. But due to your research work, we are amazed to have you here. Samara smiled and sat at the table. They all started eating. The food was tasty, but Samara felt a bit weird. She noticed apart from Daniel, the two other men hardly speak. After the dinner, Samara wished Daniel good night and went to her room. The hotel staff didn't speak a word all this time, but when Samara was about to close the door of her room, the man came to her door and said in a low voice, Have a good night's sleep, madam. Please, stay in your room at night, otherwise you might get lost in the dark. A sense of unknown fear grabbed Samara's hand. She felt that something is actually weird here. Due to the tiresome journey of the whole day, Samara couldn't think anymore. Also, she has to get up early to study the mansion for her research work. Deep sleep came down to her as she laid on the soft bed. Late night, Samara woke up from her slumber. She felt very thirsty, but as she went to drink from the jar near the bed, she noticed it was empty. She looked at her phone. It was 2 a.m. at night. Samara opened the door and came out. The corridor was dark. Only the moonlight showed her the way. Samara came down the stairs. She took a jug from the dining table and without any more delay, walked to her room. Just when she was entering the room, her senses all woke up. A sweet melodious sound captured the mansion. It took a few seconds to realize that the sound was coming from a harp. Someone was playing harp in this huge mansion? That too, at this hour of night. Samara was shocked, but the sound felt so attractive, as if it were calling her to follow it. 
Samara started to walk upstairs following the sound. As she reached the second floor, she realized the sound is coming from the end of the corridor. The second floor was completely empty. The harp kept playing. Samara was almost at the end of the hallway and she noticed the sound was coming from the last room. The room number was 303. Daniel said there was no one else in this hotel than who was living in this room. Just when the question came to Samara's mind, her curiosity increased. She knocked on the door and said, Who's there? The sound stopped immediately. Suddenly, the atmosphere around her got too quiet. Samara twisted the doorknob, but found it was locked from the inside. The silence around her started to frighten her. Without wasting any more time, she quickly got into her room and locked the door. She didn't hear any sound the entire night. The next morning, a cleaning lady came to her room. Samara was all set to get to her work. While taking her notebook and writing supplies, she asked the small, middle-aged woman, Do you know who stays in 303? But the reaction she got was totally unexpected. The cleaning lady got terrified of her question. Her face turned pale and drops of sweat appeared on her forehead. She said, I, I don't know, madam. Then she began to clean her room. The sudden change in her behavior after hearing about room 303 made Samara even more curious about that room. But she didn't say anything and left for her work. The mansion was filled with instances of Romanian artwork. Samara was standing in the garden and inspecting the garden fountain just when she heard a familiar voice. How's your work going so far, Miss Willis? Daniel came to her with a big smile. Samara said that she's loving it already. She then asked Daniel in a hesitated voice. Um, don't mind me asking, but is there anyone living in room 303? Daniel replied with a surprised face. Room 303? No, but why would you go there? We already told you it's out of use for maintenance purposes. Samara felt embarrassed for wandering around in this private property at night. She answered in a humble voice. Actually, last night I went to the dining hall to get water. Just then I heard someone playing a harp. I followed the sound and discovered it was coming from room 303 on the second floor. I just got curious because you told me there was no one else living here. Daniel hesitated too and said, um, yes, I told you the truth. No one lives in room 303. Old mansions like this sometimes resonate with many types of sound. I am sure it was something like that what you heard last night. So enjoy your stay, Miss Willis. Daniel's words made Samara realize that he didn't at all like the incident of last night. But Samara couldn't understand why everyone is acting so mysterious about this room. So she has to know what exactly happened there. Samara decided to check this room again tonight. Her gut feeling told her that these people here are definitely hiding something from her. At dinner, Daniel didn't say a word to her. The other two people ate quietly as well. As Samara finished her meal and started to walk upstairs, she saw Daniel say to the hotel staff, take a jug of water to Miss Willis's room. Hope she will have no reason to wander around the empty hall tonight. And then gave her an angry look and left. Samara became even more stubborn now. After the hotel staff left the jug in her room, she locked the door and switched off the light and started to wait silently. Tonight is the night. Samara will find out what's the matter with this room 303. Around 2.30 a.m., she came out of her holding a candle in hand. The mansion was completely silent. Only the whooshing sound of the rusty wind outside was echoing in the hallways. She tiptoed to the second floor and reached near room 303. As she twisted the doorknob, the door opened with a creaking sound. How strange. The door was unlocked tonight. Samara entered the room. The room was freezing cold. There was a large window in the room which had no glass on it. A cold wind was coming from the window by blowing its dirty curtain away. The moonlight from the window 
and the candlelight on Samara's hand made the room look very spooky. She noticed this room is just like her room, but it had only one difference. An old wooden harp stood in the middle of the room. The harp seemed unused for a very long time as the thick dust all over it had the actual color of the instrument. Samara went to the window and looked outside. The dark mountains were standing in front of her eyes. There was nothing much she could find, so she thought to go back into her room. Just then, a heavy wind came and blew out her candle. Suddenly, she heard a chuckling sound. <laughs> she quickly turned towards the door and saw a tall, thin woman standing near the harp and strumming the chords with her creepy long fingers. The moonlight fell on her face. Her eyes were wide as if she could see inside Samara. She was wearing a worn-out sleeping gown. Her hairs were floating in the air as the wind ran through them. Samara asked in a tensed voice. Sorry, the door was open so I just came to check. I heard you playing the harp last night. That's why. Before she could finish, <laughs> the woman laughed in a very scary way and said, They might have told you no one lives here, right? They told the same thing to the man who came here just like you in the middle of the night. But he came anyway, and then couldn't leave. Fear grabbed Samara's neck. She couldn't understand what this woman was talking about. She said in a frightened voice, I better get back to my room. Sorry to disturb you. As she stepped ahead towards the door, the horror unfolded in front of her eyes. With a terrifying sound of bones cracking, the woman's head turned upside down and she started laughing like a maniac. Samara's heart started to beat like a wild horse. She screamed, but no voice came out. She felt like the chilling laughter was reverberating all over the valley. Her eyes lost vision as she collapsed on the ground. The next morning, Daniel came to room 303 looking for Samara as she was not in her room. As he opened the door, he saw Samara's white, bloodless face. She was lying on the floor, her eyes full of fear and trauma. She was dead. The hotel staff, the cleaning lady, and the man at the counter came too. Four of them stood there silently, and the cleaning lady started to weep in a low voice. Daniel looked to the hotel staff and said, Bury her at the back of the garden just like the previous traveler. We are running a business here. If people can't hold back their curiosity, no one can save them from dying. Throw her stuff down the mountain and get back to work. We will be having guests from the next month all around this mansion, and make sure you keep this room locked all the time. The midnight musician still haunts room 303 of this old mansion in Romania. Let us know if you dare to take the risk by visiting this place. We will give you the address. Recently, I went camping with my best friend Thomas. We are childhood friends since we have been on several trips together. Thomas lived in the suburban area of California. After 10 kilometers from his house lied deep woods. Many people went camping and bird watching in those woods. During weekends, the woods were often crowded, so Thomas and I decided to camp as far as possible. I still regret our decision. Thomas and I left one sunny afternoon with our backpacks. After entering the woods, Thomas pointed out to our left and said in an excited tone, Peter, look, there's a railway trail on that side. We went close and found out an abandoned railway track going deep inside the woods. We decided to walk by the track. This way, we will find a serene spot for our camping and also it will be easy to come back. After walking for almost 30 to 35 minutes, we felt exhausted and decided to camp. We chose a spot under the trees and started to arrange our tent. The sun was about to set. The sky turned red as the birds started returning to their nests. The view felt awesome. We drank beer and watched the sun setting into the horizon and the night sky take over. Thomas brought his Bluetooth speaker. We tuned in some music and got busy preparing the bonfire. I collected some stones to make a round pit for the wood to burn. Thomas said, Let's go collect some wood and water. There's a riverbed nearby. 
Though the sun had set, there was still light around us. On our way to the riverbed, Thomas was picking up wooden sticks and broken branches of trees for the fire. As we got close, a sound of water flowing by came to my ears. The riverbed was more like a narrow ditch, but it had crystal clear water flowing in it. I got down to fill our flasks, and Thomas got busy collecting wood. I was almost done, just when the opposite bank of the riverbed caught my eyes. Due to the bushes, we failed to realize that there was an old graveyard on this side of the bank. I cried. Thomas, did you know we camped so close near a graveyard? His eyes lit up in excitement. He kept the pile of wood on the ground and crossed the ditch to check out the place. I too kept the flasks near the pile and went on with him. It was an old abandoned graveyard. There were at least 40 to 50 graves in it. Most of the tombstones dated from 1900 to the 1970s. I was a bit shocked to see a graveyard in the middle of the forest, but Thomas said that these graves can belong to the local tribes who once lived here. Don't know why, but something felt very odd to my eyes. Some of the graves seemed dug up recently. I told Thomas, Look, these graves seem like fresh diggings. Thomas rolled his eyes at me and said, Yeah, because zombies crawl out of them every night, and started to laugh. I shrugged it off too because of his leg pulling. Suddenly, we realized that we were standing in an abandoned graveyard, and it has gotten dark all around us. We decided to head back to our camp. We didn't change our campsite because we were brave as well as old enough not to get scared by stupid ghost stuff. Thomas worked as a chef in a restaurant, so arranging food was his department. I, on the other hand, lit the fire and helped him to prepare our dinner. Thomas brought a whole chicken, marinated for a barbecue with him. He placed the chicken over the fire, and the smell of grilled chicken filled our hearts with joy. We were drinking, talking, eating. In one word, we were having a really good time. As the night passed away, the sounds of the woods became clear to our ears. We could hear the hooting of the owls, the sounds of crickets chirping in the dark, and the wood burning in the fire. I was enjoying this calm silence when I heard some other sound too. Thomas was about to play some music just when I said, No, no, stop. Did you hear that? He looked around and said, Hear what? I told him that I heard footsteps on the dried leaves nearby. He laughed and said, You are just drunk, dude. But before he could finish laughing, a spine-chilling scream made our hearts drop to our stomachs. We heard a woman screaming in absolute fear and pain. We both stood up in quick motion. Sweat appeared on our foreheads as we stared at each other cluelessly. The scream took place for the second time, and Thomas and I figured out it was coming from the graveyard. Thomas turned all pale and looked at me. What should we do, Peter? Honestly, I was scared too, but somehow I wanted to check it out myself. So I told Thomas to be quiet and started to walk towards the graveyard. As we walked, the scream changed into a suppressed sobbing. I never believed in ghosts, but strangely, a feeling inside me said that the matter is not what it appears to be. I wish I was wrong that day. Seeing a ghost would have been much more comforting than what happened that night. We got down in the ditch and peeked to another side of the bank. What we saw made our skin crawl. A man was pulling something into the graveyard. The sobbing was coming from that thing he was pulling. As he reached near a grave and flashed his light on the ground, we saw a woman was tied from hands to toe with a tight rope. Her face was duct taped. She tried to scream again, but before she could, the man took out a sharp knife and started to stab her vigorously. We could hear the sound of blood splattering on the ground. I couldn't believe what was happening in front of my eyes. We had no weapons or anything that will help us to fight this man. Our cell phone had no tower so that we could call someone for help. Thomas couldn't take it and attempted to run away. Just then, he twisted his ankle in the ditch and fell into it. He cried in pain and the man looked right at us. I realized he has noticed us. He will not let us leave alive from here. I ran to help Thomas and got him out of the ditch. We then ran to the campsite, but before we could figure anything out, I heard running footsteps on the dry leaves. 
without delaying a second more. I grabbed my best friend's hand and we started to run for our life. We got on the rail tracks and ran. I looked back suddenly and saw a black shadow was chasing us like a hungry animal. The sharp steel knife on his hand glittered in the moonlight. Thomas was lagging behind because of his injury. I had no idea what to do. The way that man was running behind us, I knew he will end up catching Thomas. I was panting and breathing heavily. Thomas was crying for help. The entire situation was going out of our hand, and I knew if the man catches us, no one will ever know what happened to the bodies of two young boys who came camping in these woods. I saw a stone lying at the side of the railway track, and I picked it up. I turned around and waited for Thomas to cross me over. I knew I was taking a huge risk, but I had to do something. Thomas came running at me and yelling, Run, Peter, run! But I stood there gathering all the courage inside me. As soon as the man came into my sight, I saw him flashing the knife to stab Thomas in the back. His eyes were dipped in anger, and a hungry smile on his evil-looking face made him look like the demon from hell. He was almost five hands distance from me when I aimed at his head and threw the rock at him with all my strength. A sound of skull cracking and blood spattering echoed into the woods. The man held his head and fell on the ground, making painful growls. His growls eventually turned into a soft whimper, and we realized that this guy has fainted. We ran out of the woods and reached the nearby police station. We explained everything to the cops. They sent Thomas to the hospital, and I came back with them to spot where I hit the man. As we reached near the railway tracks, we noticed a lot of blood lying on the ground, but the man was nowhere to be found. I took the cops to the graveyard, and after searching the place thoroughly, the cops discovered five fresh dead bodies, including the woman's body that lied near a grave. I burst out into tears, explaining to the cops how the man killed that woman in front of our eyes and we couldn't do anything to save her. I went back to the police station and gave a detailed description of that man's face so they can catch that demon. The posters are now all over our area. The FBI has been informed about this incident too. It came to know that the man is a suspected serial killer who chose an old abandoned graveyard to dump his murder victims at night. He even dumped his murder weapons and other pieces of evidence in the graves as well. Every day, I wake up in the morning and pray to God that the cops catch this killer before he takes any more innocent lives. I wish I could have stopped him that night from disappearing. <laughs>